What's going on, guys? Welcome back to the Against All Odds podcast. Um, in this episode, I'm just going to do a full Q&A. Mimi doesn't want to be on the podcast today. She's working back there. So it's just me today going through some questions that you guys submitted on my Instagram page. I'll go through them, answer as best I can, and uh, hopefully have a good episode of the podcast here. So uh, let's roll the intro and then let's get started. <music> Before this podcast begins, I just want to thank the sponsor of today's episode, which is Santa Barbara Chocolate. Santa Barbara Chocolate uh, sources extremely high quality premium bulk chocolate products at very reasonable prices. Uh, they have a wide range of products from everything from white chocolate to pink chocolate to Swiss milk chocolate to varying levels of dark chocolate, cocoa butter, etc. And they have everything from powders to niblets to full chocolate chips. And their products are used from some of the highest quality five star restaurants around. Uh, specifically, I want to highlight their vegan cocoa powder. Their vegan cocoa powder actually helps boost nitric oxide or NO2 and has flavanols, antioxidants, and is tested for heavy metals and is one of the lowest and safest uh, safest ones around and available on the market. Uh, you can go to their website and see all the heavy metal testing that's done and you can see how low their heavy metal uh, their heavy metals are in their products. Uh, I recommend adding the powder in a smoothie or in your morning coffee or something just to give it a great flavor punch. And it's going to be way, way better than just using chocolate protein powder, like the flavored protein powder, adding the extra vegan, whole sourced, real natural sourced uh, cocoa powder is much, much better than doing the, the, the normal flavor that comes with normal chocolate protein powder. And that's because buying chocolate protein powder, uh, the protein powders are alkalized, which destroys the antioxidants. And it's some of the cheapest types around with a lot of ash and cocoa bean husk instead of the actual cocoa bean seed, which is the best part. So you can get much better ingredients if you do, do it from the from better natural sources like Santa Barbara chocolate. So if you guys are interested in checking out Santa Barbara Barbara's premium chocolate goods and uh, specifically their vegan cocoa powder to add to your own protein smoothies or something, click the link in my description or you can head to SantaBarbaraChocolate.com. So thank you very much to Santa Barbara Chocolate for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. Okay, so now let's get into the Q&A. Uh, I picked out 18 questions that you guys submitted uh, via Instagram, the uh, little question whatever thing on the story. So I'll just go through. I picked out 18 ones that I really haven't answered in a while or ever. I think I'll have a, a pretty good discussion. So uh, the very first question that we're going to just jump right into is what are you going to do when you can't find any more Vapor 11s? Uh, this is this is huge for me because if you guys have followed my, my career, you followed me on YouTube, I've pretty much strictly worn only the Vapor 11s for as long as the Vapor 11s have been out. They're my favorite boot. I, I love Mercurial Vapors and I just think that they, they fit my foot the best. And everybody always asks like, why do you not want to switch? Why do you not like the new ones? It's, it's just a personal preference. Like every pro has boots or cleats or whatever that they fit, that they like and that fits their foot the best. Those fit my foot the best and that's what I like. So if once I can't find them anymore, I'm going to have to try to move on and, and go to a new boot and, and just try to make it work. But uh, yeah, I'm going to retire. That's why I, I joked about one time, but I will try to wear the Vapor 11s for as long as possible or until a new boot comes around that I even like even more, um, but we'll see. Number two, what's the best way to train with a small group of friends? So this is a really good question. Um, I kind of have like a little template in my head whenever I go out training and depending on like the number of people, then I have like a different template. So for example, if I'm going with a small group of friends, I usually, it depends on the number, but usually I like to do some form of like game at the beginning as like a warm up game. So it's usually either two touch or rondos. Um, rondos, you need a kind of like a little bit bigger of a group. So you need like a minimum of like seven people to play rondos. Uh, but if you don't have that many people and you have a smaller group, like between three and six people, then I'd probably do two touch. I think two touch is a really good game. Get the touch feeling right, get warmed up slightly, um, and then head into your normal warm up. So I would do two touch rondos at the very beginning while people are filtering in, I'd do my full warm up, which is like 15 minutes, and then I would start the training session. So for the start of the training session, I like to do like some warm up drills, which are like stuff focused around your first touch, passing that's not like full intense playing yet 
but it's more about just doing like a simple drill. So I think passing combinations is great. You can do like the square passing. You can do zigzag passing. You can do any form of, of passing, you know, high stepping through the cones, passing, doing one or two touch or whatever. Some form of that, which is really going to even warm you up more. Again, really develop your first touch passing the first and two touch passing, I think is critical. And then you can progress into the actual playing. So 2v2s, 3v3s, 4v4s, I think that should make up the majority of the training session just playing against each other small sided and then at the very end you can do some crossing and finishing you can do some another game like horseshoes you can finish with another game of two touch or do something like that but that's like the template of a training sh session that i really like to do so you have your game at the beginning to warm up you have your full actual warm up you have your passing combination or whatever to really work on first touch and the fundamentals of the game then you have the majority the bulk of the session which is just playing you know 2v2s 3v3s 3v3s plus one whatever whatever the the, the numbers you have and then again finish it with uh some crossing finishing a game of horseshoes another game of two touch or something and again, you kind of like, I always like to ask the people I'm training with too, you know, what do you guys want to work on? What positions are you, et cetera? Because if I have, you know, a whole bunch of defenders, maybe we'll do a little bit of like um, building out of the back type movements or do, it will form and create a drill based off what people want to work on in their positions. So that really kind of depends as well. But I think that's pretty much what goes through my head when I'm making a training session. And that's just what I do in my off season for me and my my friends when I train um but everybody's different and everybody's got their personal what they like to work on what they like to focus on how they like to structure a session all that stuff um <clears throat> the next question uh how did you stay motivated when people were doubting you I think this is a, a good question but it's kind of funny when you ask like how did you stay motivated when people were doubting you but for me in my career I've always found that I've been the most motivated like I use the the doubt, it's very cliche, but I've used the doubt that I've had throughout my career to motivate me even more. And I've done this like at multiple stages of my career. At the very beginning, you know, uh, when I wanted to go play Division One college soccer, one of the most motivating things that I've, I, I had in something like to prove people wrong was when I was on the B team of my club team and I got, you know, I'd play some tournaments when they, in the A team needed some players. I play it with the A team sometimes and, and the parents or whoever would be like, Oh, you know, this guy thinks he's going to go D one. Uh, that's Matt Sheldon. He's the B team player, but he's, you know, talking to UC Davis, like, we'll see how that goes. And I've always used that like the doubt from other players, from teammates, from parents or whoever I've used that doubt to really just kind of like, I'm going to show you, you know, I'm going to show you that I can play on the B team. I can show you that I'll be this type of player, whoever, and I still can play D1. And I've used that to go and play in college. I've used the doubt of teammates, players, uh, p parents, friends, whoever, to go and push me to play and to push me to reach my goals, to push me to train harder. The same exact thing when I was in college. I remember I came home one time uh, during winter break and I was talking to a friend's parent. This was like during my junior year of college. And they were like, what do you want to do after college? You know, what do you, what kind of career path are you looking at? I was like, I want to play professional soccer. That's what I told this, uh, this mom. And she kind of like, she, she laughed. It was like, oh, like, oh, okay. You know, you know, but really, what do you want to do? And so, you know, it's like, well, that, that is what I want to do. And so again, it's the little bit of things that kind of motivates you. You remember those little moments for the rest of your life. And like that little moment kind of gives you a little extra fuel in your training session because you tell them that you want to play pro and you know if they laugh at you or they say what do you really want to do all you can think about is like this is what i'm going to do this is how this is what i really want to do i'm going to be a pro you know it's not like funny like that's actually my career goal that's what i want to do so i've used that uh, getting to the collegiate level i used that pushing onto the pro level and specifically the last time i used it was when i was down in new zealand and I wanted to push back into the pro level. You know, I went from the USL level down to the semi-professional level in New Zealand, and I was playing against, you know, other teams. And there's always, you know, a couple of games I'd play in. Opponents would say stuff like, oh, you know, you think you're going to play pro again, like your career is over. Like they say this in the games or after the games or where, whenever. And those little comments, again, I, I can remember specific players telling me my career is over. I can remember um, opponents telling me that you'll never make it back in the USL again. And again, it just motivates me. I literally in the next workouts that next week, or even up until now, I still, I still remember those moments. And I still think back to that and use all the, the criticism that's being said 
about how you'll never do this, you'll never do this or whatever to motivate and to push me even further to really accomplish my goal. Because I do think you need to be very intrinsically motivated and have that why in yourself of why you want to accomplish something. That's the main thing. But you can always use those extrinsic, ex, ex, am I saying that right? Extrinsic motivators or whatever, the external motivators to motivate you even more. You know, people doubting you or, you know, in the need to support your family or whatever. You can use those external motivators to even push you even more. And so throughout my career, I've, I've done that. And I think that, you know, when people doubt me, it's not, it never makes me less motivated. It always usually makes me more motivated. So that's kind of like the, the long answer to that, to that question. Um, number four, there are so many drills out there. How do I know what is best for my growth as a player? Uh, this is a really good question. I think, you know, to sum up, this is going to be a long, another long answer question, but to sum up, don't overthink it. Because I think that, yes, you know, I have videos out there with 100 individual drills, 101 partner training drills. You can see new drills on Instagram every single day, new passing patterns. It, it looks like a lot. There's so much out there that you can do. I know it can feel overwhelming when you step on the field and you're like, crap, what should I do? But it boils down to the very, you know, the essence of it is just playing with the ball. If you go outside and you just play and you and you do whatever and you're just a kid, you know, playing with a ball, juggling, you know, taking some shots against a, a, a wall or a fence, uh, doing a, a couple imaginary step overs against a, an imaginary defender, playing 1v1 with a with your little brother, doing stuff like that. Just playing with the ball is going to get you to improve it there. Yes, there can be drills that will even get you to improve more, but I don't want any player to be thinking that to be overwhelmed with the amount of drills and the amount of like technology and everything there is out there that they think they can't just go outside, juggle, dribble through some cones, hit a ball against a wall and and not improve a ton because the best players in the world, you know, have improved from just playing pickup in the streets, have improved from just from kicking a ball against a wall for hours and hours, have improved from just juggling. And I, I always like to look at it, you know, simplicity, simplicity, simplicity. Yes, I think all adding extra stuff, checking the shoulder, looking at a, a screen with a number, going through all these patterns, high knees, stepping over something, it's always going to be good and beneficial. But it, I don't want it to take away from the fact that all you have to do is pass a ball against a wall and focus on your touch, focus on hitting the perfect weight of the ball against the wall so it comes back with the perfect weight, setting yourself up for that next touch, that next pass, doing that for 30 minutes a day is going to improve you. So I don't want you to be overwhelmed thinking there's so much to do, I don't even know where to start. Just play with the ball. Now having said that, you know, I think that you also, once you start to go outside and you're just playing and you want to even go do a little bit more and you're thinking, okay, look, I'm, I'm doing the basics. I'm juggling, I'm dribbling through cones, I'm playing 1v1 against my brother, I'm playing pickup in the streets when I can, I'm doing all that basic stuff. But what's the next step? What drill should I do to really improve even more? And I think the answer to that is to look at yourself as a player. I've always looked at myself as like the FIFA card. You literally look at your FIFA ratings that you imaginarily, that you're that you would imagine yourself to have, and you know you go through your attributes and you ask yourself, you know, what is kind of holding me back? What's holding me back from reaching that next level that I want to be? You know, if I'm on JV right now of my high school team, what do I think is holding me back from reaching the varsity level? Or if I'm playing at the collegiate level right now, what do I think of my FIFA stats is holding me back from from getting to the professional level. And I've done that every single level from 11, year old, 11 years old up until now at the USL level looking to go into the MLS level. Every single year, I am constantly looking at myself and critiquing myself to think, what is holding me back? And so I think what you should do when you wanna figure out what drills or what workouts or what you should do is to do that and to find that weakness and then to, to focus on drills or to tailor the session or to tailor the drills around improving that weakness. Um, let me give you a, a few examples. And I know I'm kinda of going off on a huge tangent, but I think this is so crucial to your development as a player is to identifying your weaknesses and then tailoring drills to improve that weakness so that it's not holding you back anymore. Um, for example, uh, back when I was 14 years old and I was entering into high school and I wanted to play varsity soccer, the coach of the varsity team 
he looked at me and said, look, Matt, you are quick, you are fit, you are technically sharp, but the thing that's holding you back is you're 100 pounds right now and you're tiny and frail and I'm scared to put you in a game right now because I think you're going to get hurt. You're just a very, you, you don't have the athletic frame that I, I'm looking for at the varsity level, which is definitely an American approach to it. But that's what was holding me back from looking from playing at the varsity level. So I tailored around all the extra work I did around gaining muscle, gaining weight, gaining, improving my, my athleticism so that I could, you know, improve that weakness of my strength and athleticism so that I could play for the varsity level. You know, I was I was doing a ton and eating a ton of high quality meals, a ton of protein. I was working out four or five times a week. As soon as I, was, as I could, I was in the gym lifting weights. So I looked at my FIFA card. I, I asked uh, no, mentors and coaches as well, what is my what is holding me back? They told me it was my athleticism and my strength. So then I tailored the rest of my my extra work that I was doing outside of team trainings around getting bigger and stronger. And then if we progress even further, let's say into college, you know, I talked to my head coach. I said, what's holding me back? Why, why am I not playing professional soccer right now when I was in college? And my coach, you know, would tell me, I think athletically, you're a pro. You know, you have the athleticism, the speed, the fitness, everything as of a pro professional soccer player. Um, your tactical mindset, you know, is, is decent, but I think the weakness that you have is your technical first touch, your technical skills, your first touch, your control of the ball, your your comfort on the ball, your ball mastery, stuff like that. And he told me to go improve that. So when I was in college, I tailored around the drills. I focused the drills around improving that low FIFA rating of my first touch, of my technical ability, of my dribbling, stuff like that. So I would hit the wall, you know, I'd go, go to the wall, one, two touch passes, I'd work on juggling, I'd do wall juggling. If I had a teammate, I'd do that drill, that simple drill of making a box around myself, having him ping in a ball, and I'd work on controlling that ball right in the box and then playing it back to him or taking that first touch outside the side of the box and then playing it back to him. Or I'd work on wall juggling and try to do two touch wall juggling for as long as I could. I would always tailor and focus drills around based off what my low FIFA rating is. So going back to this question, I know this is a long answer again, but going back to this question of what drill should I focus on to best improve my growth as a player, look at your FIFA rating, you know, literally draw it out and give yourself an honest representation of your numbers or ask your friend or a teammate or your coach to kind of like do that for you and show you what your weakness is. Find your weakness and then ask, ask them or look online or figure out some drills that will improve that weakness. And you shouldn't just focus on there. You know, even though when I was just working on my first touch or I was just working on my athleticism, I still was doing extra stuff. But that should be like the core of it is improving what's holding you back from reaching that next level. And that's how I've always viewed my career. And even now, you know, at the USL level, personally, I think my first touch and my and my control and my my speed of play is, is good. I think athletically, I, I, I'm a very athletic player, even in the USL at the professional level now. I'm, I'm very fit. I'm fast. But I think personally what's holding me back is that attacking presence, is combining, is creating chances, is having five to ten assists in a season, is getting on the score sheet, scoring a goal you know, in a game. If I can do that, if I can really improve the creativity in the attacking third and I can improve the chances that I create, as a, as a player, I think that is what's holding me back from having the season I want to then progress into the MLS. So I'm working on that constantly. I'm staying after training every single day and doing uh, you know, 1v1 at a cone, pushing it down the line, whipping it across, working on speed of play and creativity stuff like rondos and small sided possession. I'm always focused on what's holding me back of reaching the next level and I'm creating drills around that. So it's not a simple answer and being like, these are the drills that's going to help you the most because you're going to need different drills depending on what you need to really focus on. So self-evaluate, create a training session or, or find out or ask other people for drills to that, that will work on those lacking areas of your game and then tailor the session using majority of those drills while still putting in work and improving on your strengths and on, on the, on the, on the stuff of your game that is still crucial. So that's my answer for that question. Um, but yeah, hopefully that, hopefully that makes sense and hopefully that helps. Um, 
Five, can I still go pro even if you don't, even if I don't have an amazing college career? Uh, yeah. So I had a very, I had a decent college career. I had I scored some, a lot of goals. I had a, a very, I started from my freshman year in my eyes as a pretty successful collegiate career. And that really helped me get the confidence and uh, kind of like open up some doors into the next level, into the semi-pro level and into the professional level. However, you know, you don't need to have a, a successful college career. I know players that have even more successful professional careers than I do, but have had worse collegiate careers than I did. Um, f- for one example, I one of my really good friends, Elliot Horde, played at Sacramento for a number of years, played over in Sweden, a, a fantastic player, and has really performed at the USL level. I think he's a, a great player. And I think, you know, to be honest, has had a better professional career than I have. But I you know, in, in kind of like comparisons, I think I had a a more successful collegiate career than he did. I kind of fit that college, the college game. I, I, I just kind of went into that system, did better. And I think it opened up more doors at the professional level earlier for me, but Elliot, you know, he being at the, uh, at the college level, he started, he had great games. He had some goals and stuff, but he never really found that he, his game really didn't fit the college style. And so he still was a good player. You could see that, but he just didn't find that success during his college years. So he went on, he had to go over and did some, some combines, did some trials all over Europe, did the semi-pro level for a number of years. And then he broke into the pro game and just excelled. Then he had, he's had a great last few years. And so you, it's not necessary to have a great collegiate career because some players just don't fit those molds. And I have teammates right now who go to college for a year, two years, and they go, you know, it's not for me. They leave and then they go find success at the professional level. So I think that it helps to have a successful collegiate career because it will open up more doors for you. You know, you'll get the interest of scouts and agents and your college coach might help you get your foot in the door with a professional team. But I know many, many pros who do not find success in college and still have successful careers. Um, so that's just my opinion on, uh, on that, on that matter. Um, oops, lost it. Uh, number six, how does one, how does one deal with burnout? Like I can't allow myself to take days off sometimes. Um, yeah, I think this is a a good question. Um, burnout for me, I get that all the time. Like I, it's, it might seem like it through the videos. And if you watch me on YouTube that you think that I'm always so motivated and you know, it looks, it looks like that probably with the music going over, but there's days where I'll go out to the field. There's days where I get in the gym and I really do feel just burnt out. My body feels tired. Mentally I'm fatigued. I'm just don't have that motivation. You just feel slower. You feel heavy. And it really does happen. And I think that the best way to go around burnout is to take a rest day, maybe even a rest week. If it's a really tough week or let's say you had a a crazy tough season, taking a couple weeks off after the end of the season to let your body completely refresh, let your mind refresh, just to completely start anew and get that motivation back, get that hunger to go back out and train and to work again, I think is so critical. Um, But I, I completely relate to how hard it is to do that. I mean, it took me up until I was like 26, 27 until I could finally take a week or two off after a full professional season because I used to take, you know, I used to do an entire professional season and then I would take like two days off and I'd be back in the gym and back on the field working again. And in the short term, that might be good, but long term, it definitely can wear on your body. So I think I really made it a priority for myself to, to realize that taking those rest days is just as beneficial, if not more beneficial in the long term, uh, as to shortening up the rest and just going back at the field as early as possible, because you have to look at your career as a marathon. You know, if you can stay healthy for as long as possible, and if those rest weeks are going to refresh you mentally, physically, spiritually, whatever, to get back on the field, to have even better sessions later, it's even going to be better for you to take that week off than it is to act, just skip the rest and just go straight in, back into the work again. And I know it's always, it's a very tough balance because you don't want to just take weeks off, you know, eight times a year, but you have to find that balance of, of the perfect amount of rest that's going to benefit you and get you hungry to get back on the field again and to work again, um, while also not being too much where you are kind of like uh, taking the easy way out and just having more rest days than you need. 
And I think for me, what I've really done is usually in, in season, it's it's easy because they give you the rest days. You get one rest day a week pretty much. And that's the day after your game or maybe two days after your game, depending on the, on the team. So that's easy. You get one rest day a week for the nine months you're in season. I like to then take two weeks off at the end of the season. Now, before when I was younger, I tried to do that. I never did. And I think it kind of caught up to me. So you know, now I'm very hard on myself to take two weeks completely off at the end of the season to relax, let my body recover, mind recover. And then I'll take a few days off depending on the time. Maybe I'll take a few days off for Thanksgiving, a few days off for Christmas, and then that's it for off season. Everything else is doing at least a little bit of work in the gym, going for a run, stuff like that. And then, you know, as always though, that's like the general template, but then I kind of tailor it to myself. And if I need a week where it's in off season or in season or whenever, where my body is just something's hurting, I'll take more rest days to, to tailor it around how I'm feeling and how my my burnt outness of my body is feeling. Um, so I have a general template again, and I tailor it to how my body's feeling day to day. And then I think again, what really helps to take the rest days is having another hobby or something that you really can focus on. So examples would be to going and just hanging out an entire day with your family, to going to see movies, going to go uh, golfing, going for a hike, making a day trip to go drive out somewhere and to go do something, to, to find something that whether whatever that is, that shifts your focus away from just hanging out on the couch and just thinking about how you should be training or you should be working out to go do something, hanging out with people to almost distract yourself so that you can take that rest. For example, in those two weeks after season, I like to go on a trip, you know, if I can, or I like to go and, and really focus on golfing like four days a week, or I like to go and, and go visit my friend in a different city or something just to, to distract me and really force me to take those rest days. So that's how I deal with burnout. And that's how I really schedule my rest days to help me feel more refreshed throughout the year. Um, number seven, uh, why did you use, oh, sorry, seven. <laughs> what did you use? What did you use as I'm struggling with this question right now? Number seven, what did you use as motivation to keep working hard every day when you were younger? Um, for me, it was just, I loved, I loved it. Like it's, it's so, I always say this, but it's so cliche. Like, yeah, I loved it, but I, I just really liked, I was a very active kid. I really liked working out. I liked going outside and running around and sweating. And I love the, the progress that I could see from training with a ball with my juggling. I love to try to beat my juggling record. I love to try to beat my brother 1v1 and put, make competitions out of that. I love to try to do two touch against the wall and try to get beat my two touch wall juggling record. I love to go to the gym and to track my weight to see if I was gaining muscle. I love to see how much I was squatting and then two months later to see if I was squatting more. I just love that progress and I love putting in work and being active. So it all kind of went hand in hand for me. It was never like one of those things where I woke up and I was like, I hate going and working out. I hate playing soccer. What's How do I get motivation to do this? I just like doing it. And yes, there were days where I'm like, I'm tired. I don't want to go work out. I don't want to go train. But I just overall, I'd say 80% of the time, I was excited to go and, and train. I was excited to go play my brother 1v1. I was excited to try to work on juggling. I was excited to go to the gym and, and try to become stronger and get bigger and get, gain muscle. So, I, I, I mean, I did need motivation at, at times, but it was just so internally motivated that I would have just done it you know, regardless of, of, you know, where I was playing, if I was on the B team, C team, if I had no team, I just really liked doing it. And I, I could still, to this day, I like going, I look forward to going to the gym and getting a good workout. I look forward to training at the end of when training ends. I usually, if my body's feeling good, I usually want to stick around and do extra and play more and hit crosses and hit work on my long ball. If my body was willing, I would be out there even longer and doing more than I could than I am doing right now. But it's it's just I loved it. I love putting in the work. So I really didn't need as much motivation, you know, on the day to day. Sure there were times where I did need motivation, a little extra fuel, but for the most part I just I just enjoyed it. Okay, number eight, what is the best way to go about contacting USL League Two teams? So 
uh, it's kind of funny that you, it was specifically about USL League 2 teams. If you guys don't know the USL League 2, USL League 2 is like a semi-professional level. It's literally as close as you can get to the professional level. It's just like right underneath there. USL League 1 is the professional level, fully professional league. USL League 2 is kind of like a semi-professional league where mostly collegiate players play in or players that are looking to push up into the USL League One or USL Championship will play in. Great league. I've played there for two seasons during my junior and senior year of, of college, and it really helped me. Uh, in terms of contacting those teams, I would contact them the same exact way that I would contact any other semi-professional, any other professional, any, any other college team, or even actually, to be honest, any academy team out there as well. I would reach out to them. I would go to their website. I would look up their coaches, try to find their emails or try to find any contact information. Sometimes there's even a specific email if you're interested in trying out or, or going to an open tryout. I would find the email, I'd find the coach, uh, or I would you know, use my own connections if I knew anybody who plays for the team or I knew anybody who knows the coach or whatever to try to get that coach's email. And I would send an email basically saying, hi, my name is Matt Sheldon. I'm a 27 year old American right back who can also play left back. Um, who has played for a number of years at this team, this team, this team, or wherever and whatever leagues or places I played at. Uh, and I'm looking to, to play for your specific team. So if I was, like, for example, if I'll, I'll, re, I'll write this email right now as if I was actually trying to contact that very first USL League 2 team that I contacted, um, which was the San Jose Earthquakes U23s. I'd be like, hi, my name is Matt Sheldon. I'm a junior forward striker, right winger at UC Davis currently. Um, so far in my career, I've had 13 goals and four assists. Uh, and I would say that I'm looking to play during the off season as before I head into my senior year at UC Davis. And I would say that, uh, you know, I'm interested in your team for whatever reason, for example, for the San Jose earthquakes, it's like, I would love to play for the San Jose earthquakes. U 23s is the, the Bay area is just a very short drive from UC Davis up in Sacramento. Uh, I would love to, to come in and, and trial for the team or to attend an open trial or do something. I would love any, any more information that I could have. And then I would attach my CV and my highlight video and see what would happen. Uh, also on their website, you could probably find any open combines or open trials or open tryouts that they are hosting or, or attending or whatever. And I would uh, pay and attend those open combines, tryouts and trials. So I would just try everything. I mean, I'd send an email, send the CV, send the highlight video, attend open trials, attend open tryouts or whatever, and see what happens. And then I would do that for a number of USL League Two teams. And that's the same exact way that you go about a professional team, a college team, or whatever. The only difference with college teams is that you're also putting in your academic information, like your GPA and SAT score and stuff like that. But it's, it's a pretty simple format. Introduce yourself, give a little bit of background about yourself, uh, tell them what you're looking for specifically in terms of a trial and then attach your CV and highlight video and send it off and don't a hundred percent expect a reply. You know, sometimes you need to send out a hundred emails in order to get that one coach who's like, yeah, come on in. Um, number nine, what's the biggest lesson you've learned in your pro career? That's a big question. I like that question. I would say the biggest lesson that I've learned throughout this, the entire time I've been playing is, um, kind of like patience. Uh, Gary Vee will say this a lot. It's like uh, in, the, in the micro, in the short term, it's constant work, constant stress, moving, constant movement, work, a grind. But in the macro, in the big scheme of things, you have this huge sense of patience that it's like things will work out. You know, my career is very long. It doesn't matter. I don't need to sign a contract tomorrow. I don't need to, you know, have everything happen tomorrow over 10 years just to focus on the long-term growth and development as myself as a player and and things will work out if i put in the work and i'm not patient and i'm going after things and i'm trying to create opportunities in the short term and that combination of constant work constant grind constant impatience of reaching out to teams attending open tryouts combined with the long-term mindset of i don't need to sign a contract at 20 Two, 21. I, I can sign it at 23. I can sign it at 24. It doesn't matter if I need to drop down two levels when I'm 25 and play at the semi-professional level in New Zealand. I'm just focused on my long-term growth and development over the long-term scale of my career. I think that that combination of that macro and micro mindset is huge. 
and even more specifically is that ability to ride the roller coaster of emotions that you have in your career. You know, I say this so often, but your career, when you're going through this, uh, as you go through this, you're going to have the highest highs of signing contracts, scoring goals, accomplishing your, uh, your dreams, as well as the lowest lows of being injured, dropping down, becoming a free agent, getting benched, all that stuff combined. And it, and it switches so fast. You literally can be scoring a goal, top recruit, and then you get injured, you're out for nine months, and it, within a day, it can switch that fast. So I've, I've found that as you go through that roller coaster, to keep such a level head, to not expect anything. When you're at your highs, you know, keep working, be humble. When you're at your lows, just have that positive outlook like things will change. You know, keep on working, keep working. Keeping neutral through the highs and the lows as you go through this full career is, is huge for me. Um, that's definitely what I've learned the most from being a pro for the last six years now. <laughs> um, 10, how did you manage individual football training in season or how do you manage individual football training in season? So usually I like to stay after, so I'll do the full training session and I like to stay after anywhere from 15 to 30 minutes working on areas of my game that I really want to get extra work in crosses long balls, one V ones, doing something like that, that I really want to work even to touch doing something a little bit extra just for 30 minutes. At the end of the training is a very easy way to get in extra work in, in an area that you want to work on because you don't need to rewarm up. You don't need to head back out. You know, after you're all tired, you come back home. You don't need to get back dressed up, head outside and go get a secondary training session. And it's just a really easy and good way to get in extra work in areas that you want to work on. And then usually, you know, it's hard always in season with a professional team because you're training and playing games and it's such a crazy and intense schedule. It's very difficult to get extra individual sessions in and you can, you just have to listen to your body, you know, go week by week. Sometimes you'll have an easier week. Sometimes you might not be playing in the games. Sometimes, you know, you, you might, your team might be focusing on the attackers and the wing play and the forward play, and you're not getting any crosses in, or you're not getting any defense work in or whatever. And then you can get an extra session focused around little things that you want to improve on. But it is very difficult in season just because your coaches and your weight, you know, your weight trainers, and everybody is pushing you so much day by day, week by week. So you have to listen to your body and you have to focus on doing the extra while also being smart and being fresh and ready for the games and stuff like that. So usually I stay after 15 to 30 minutes after training to do, do a little bit of extra work. And if I'm not playing in games or if I'm, if it's been a very light week of training or something, then I, I might go out and do an extra session to focus on something. But again, it's light and it's more technical versus a more physical work because I know I need to stay fresh. And the only exception to that is if it's going for a long period of time where I'm not starting or playing, then I would really ramp up the extra fitness and the extra cardio and the John Terry cardio or whatever so I can stay match fit or game fit while I'm not playing. So it, it's hard because it, it just varies week by week. There might be a week where I never stay after. I, ne I might not do any extra work if my body is telling me, look, I'm fatigued, I'm tired, I need a break. And there might be a week where I'm doing a John Terry cardio session. I'm doing extra ball work. I'm going out to the field and even doing a double day. So it really depends week by week based on a variety of different circumstances and what's going on with my day-to-day -day, like gameplay and career. Um, number 11, do you feel as driven? This is a good question. Do you feel as driven as you were a year ago, five years ago, 10 years ago? So I definitely, I definitely do. I mean, I, I still, after every single training session, I still, you know, when we're done, I still have this, like, I want to do more. I want to do more. I want to do more. I'm still in the gym having just as good of workouts as I was, you know, 10 years ago. Um, and I still have that drive. Like I, I'm not satisfied being at the USL level. I still have that drive to go up and up and up. Um, it just gets, you know, to be honest, it, as you go up and up and up each level, each jump that you go on this, this ladder is more and more difficult. You know, it's, it, it was much, much easier to make that jump from the B team to the A team of my, my U16, U17 club team 
than it was to go and make that jump up to the D1 level. And then it was much easier to do that than it was to make that jump up to the professional level. And it was much easier to do that than it is or has been to make that jump from the US level, USL level up to the MLS level or that MLS level up to that top flight European level. Each jump is it gets more and more competitive and you're competing with more and more higher quality players for less and less spots. So yeah, I mean, it's just, it's just very, very competitive and very difficult to do it, but I'm still as driven as I was a year ago, five years ago, 10 years ago, um, which is really, you know, that's, that's a big thing. I thought that as I would get older in my, as I would get older and later in my career, you know, you kind of have in the back of your head, like, is my drive going to go down? Am I not going to enjoy this as much? Is it going to be more of a, a struggle to get into the gym or to stay after and do extra work? But to be honest, I, I just, I still am just as driven. I still love working and, and pushing myself just as much as I do now as I did back when I was 17 years old, 10 years ago. Um, number 12, what is your primary goal today? Um, if we're looking like, just today like if you're saying like what is my primary goal for june 27th this sunday then my goal for today it's today's like my rest day i did a hour-long walk as a form of like active recovery i'll probably do some self myofascial release with the foam roller lacrosse ball uh, maybe a bit of yoga but today is to rest because we're really ramping up now full contact team training we're progressing to getting ready for the seasons to start so it's all about being hydrated and getting the body ready for that tough week of training as we ramp it up even more to get ready for that season to start um, in July, mid-July. So that's the goal for today. But if we're talking about like what is the goal for like today as in this year and the macro look of things, I mean the goal today is to have um, – finish out this whatever the season looks like this year finish it out have a, the best season i possibly can given the circumstances so i can set myself up the best way i can to try to play um to, to try to play at the next level wherever that is whether that's over in europe or the mls like i like i said in that last question i'm still just as driven to try to push up to the next level today as i was five years ago um next question 13 what are your thoughts on listening to music during a workout versus a podcast versus just complete silence? Um, I think there's no right or wrong answer to this at all. I think it's 100% down to what you prefer and what helps you have the best workouts. For me, you know, uh, if I'm doing like a cardio session and it, like I'm going for a longer run or I'm doing something where I'm, I don't need to be a hundred percent focused on the workout, you know, it's like, yeah, maybe like, for example, the recovery walk this morning, a hundred percent, I would listen to a podcast or I listen to some music or whatever. But if it, my, if it's a workout where I have to be very, very focused in on, then sometimes I prefer just not to listen to a podcast. Cause I like to have my mind a hundred percent on what's going on. Um, and that's again, just me, but I know people who have great workouts or better workouts if they're listening to a podcast. I know people who have worse workouts if they're listening to a podcast. It just, it really just depends. So you have to go and try it out for yourself and figure out in what method do I get the best workouts in generally? And then you go with that. Um, for example, when I'm working out and lifting weights, it's, I don't like listening to a podcast as much because I can't, I usually get distracted and I'm usually just not focusing as much on like the mind muscle connection or my form. I'm kind of just going and listening to the podcasting and distracting myself a little bit. If I'm doing an hour of cardio, that's okay. But if I'm doing that intense, like focused, heavier weightlifting session, I like just background music or I like silence. And that's just for me. Um, and usually when I train, I usually prefer just to have silence. Like when I'm out of the field doing an individual session or a partner session, I like just silence. Um, do you meditate? The num question number 14, do you meditate? Why or why not? I do like a little bit. I'm not like a huge, you know, like full, like uh, full guided meditation or do anything. I do breathing like I'll, I'll before I go to sleep or um, if I'm feeling overwhelmed sometimes, like I'll just focus on my breathing, which is a form of meditation where you just kind of, you know, count your breath in, hold it for like a couple seconds, count out your breath out, hold it for a couple seconds, breathe in and, and kind of do that. Like a four seconds in four second, hold four seconds out or whatever the meta, whatever the technique is. 
And I like that just because especially before you fall asleep, I like to really clear my mind. and I really just try to focus on the breathing. And I find that I pass out almost instantly when I do that. But I'm not like I'm not like the kind of guy who wakes up and has my daily meditation where I'm sitting out looking out, you know, the window. That's just that's just my personal preference. So I do meditate a little bit, I guess you could say, but it's not fully like I have my hour of meditation every day at the same time. It just kind of depends on how I'm feeling. Um, question 15. Do you have a pre-match routine or ritual? I used to. This is a funny story. I used to have, uh, I used to be very ritualistic with my pre-match uh, routine and the full day leading up to it. I, I had to have everything perfect, you know. I needed to even put my boots on, on my left foot first, then my right foot, then I would lace up my left foot, then lace up my right foot. I needed to put on my socks and my, and my shin pads on the, the, the same exact way I needed to have. Like I, for me, it was all mental. I needed to have like the same thing for breakfast, lunch, and dinner before. And it, it was just like, I, I had so many routines that like, I thought it was helping, but then randomly I had this one time, I talked about this in a podcast in a, in a, a while ago, but where I basically drove down with a scout to go watch a game with the hopes of playing. But I really was just kind of watching this like semi-pro or professional team play in an exhibition game in off season. And I got the chance to play and I didn't have my normal breakfast. I didn't have my normal meal. I had my boots, but I didn't even have my normal shin pads. I had to borrow somebody else's. So everything was just completely thrown off, but I was still able to have a really good game and put myself in the zone during the game. And I kind of realized, look, all that ritualistic, all those routines, all those rituals before the game, they're good if they can help you. But I never want to be that type of player that if something does go wrong, that it's going to ruin my performance. Michael Phelps had this with his trainer. His trainer used to crack his goggles before competitions or sometimes just to throw, you know, a wrench in the, in the a cog or whatever in the machine just to see how he would react and, and teach him that he needs to have that mental discipline that no matter what happens, you still need to perform. So now I kind of have that more of that mindset, like, look, I should be able to have Chick-fil-A or McDonald's before the game. I should be able to uh, completely think and be in the mindset that I'm not starting or playing or whatever. And then everything changes and I need to wear a teammate's boots or my jersey or my compression shorts. I forgot those. And I'm in underwear instead. And everything's going wrong in terms of my ritual or my routine. I still should be able to go on the field and switch it on and play just as good, no matter, no matter what I did before the game. And sure, you know, there is some truth to the fact that if you need to have good nutrition, you need to be hydrated, but I'm talking about everything else. I should be able to really switch it on mentally and be able to perform no matter what's going on. So now I really don't have that much of a pregame routine or rituals. I really just try to eat healthy. I try to stay hydrated and I try to do what my body needs to have the best performance on the field physically. But I always have that look out of, it doesn't matter. I should be able to, to go right now today. I should be able to get a call if it were to happen from an MLS team today. Matt, we're flying you out to go to play for FC Dallas today. Let's go. I should be able to switch it on and be ready to play. Um, so that's just my mentality when it comes to that stuff. Uh, 16, two must-have supplements for pro footballers that actually help. So there is no supplement that you must have no supplement that anybody must have. You can get everything from diet alone. There's nothing that you that you need to supplement with. And I want to, that to be very, very clear. The supplements are exact. The name of supplement, supplement is a supplement to your diet. So what you should try to do is try to get everything, all the nutrients and vitamins and minerals and, and the macros and everything through normal diet alone. And sometimes that can be hard. So when that is hard, you should recognize what you might be lacking and then supplement it with those supplements to kind of to, to increase that uh, range of, of all the vitamins and minerals and, and macronutrients that you're getting. For example, a normal person, a normal athlete, it, sometimes they can find it's hard to get protein because protein, you know, you have your eggs in the morning, you have, you know, chicken or beans or legumes or whatever sources of protein you have. If you are a high performance athlete, a professional footballer, you're going to need a lot of protein and that can be tough to get through diet alone. And sometimes it's very, very good, 
to just supplement it with, you know, a 40 gram protein shake where you just mix it with water, shake it up, and there's 40 grams right there. Easy. Or, for example, most Americans, I think 75% of Americans out there are vitamin D deficient. They don't have enough vitamin D in their diet or they don't spend enough time in the sun soaking up vitamin D. So I'll, I think, you know, like for example, I supplement with vitamin D, even though I probably do spend enough time in the sun playing soccer. But you should look at your diet, look at your lifestyle, get blood work done, and find out what nutrients you aren't hitting in order to reach your goals. And then supplement to try to reach those goals. And for the most part, I'd say the most common, the two most common nutrients or supplements that people add to their diet uh, because they're not getting it in their diet alone is usually protein powder and vitamin D. That's what I've seen. Or fish oil. A lot of people don't have enough fish in their diet, so fish oil can be good. Um, but yeah, there's no must have supplements. There's nothing that you need to have or that every pro footballer supplements with. You need to look at your diet and see what you're deficient in, what you need more of, what you have enough of, and, and tailor your supplements to that. What advice would you give to someone who is trying to build a brand around soccer? Uh, that's, a, that's a really, really good question. And I could go, you know, I, this could be an entire podcast in itself talking about building a brand. Uh, but I'd say a, a few tips that I would have is I think number one and the most important thing is when you're making content, whatever platform that is, whether that's on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, wherever you're making content, make content that, you, that is not about trying to get views, but it's more about how can I give enough value to the person watching this? Like whenever I make a video, whenever I make any type of video, I would wanna make, I have that in my mind that this video, I want this to be able to help uh, an alternate version of Matt Sheldon watching this as a professional soccer player, as a collegiate athlete, as a kid or whoever, I want this to really benefit and help that Matt Sheldon. So I look about at it as how can I make a video or an Instagram post where if I was scrolling through that I would look at this and go, wow, I want to save this. I, I really like this. This is really going to help me in my career. For example, like I, I would go and look at the, the, the number, the amount of protein that you need in a diet as an athlete, talking about supplements or whatever, I would go through and create an Instagram post really detailing the specific you know grams per pound of body weight that an athlete, a professional soccer player is recommended to have. And I would create that Instagram post because that's something that I would really benefit from reading about. you know. Or if there's a new study that comes out talking about how an extra 2% of your body fat can lead to you know, 0.1 second slower of your 40 yard dash time, that's a topic, that's something that I would really be interested in about. Or uh, the video, seven drills that I wish I would have focused more on as a kid. That's something that literally is tailored to younger Matt Sheldon. So I always look at creating content as not just doing something that, you know, just to get content out there, to create a good video that's gonna get views, but how can I make something? How can I make a vlog? How can I do anything that would really benefit somebody watching this and what I would enjoy watching, that I would improve from, that I would benefit from? And that is like a huge mindset that I have going about my full Become Elite. So I think whatever your niche is and whatever you wanna make content about, try to tailor it around the consumer, not about how can I get more likes? How can I build my brand? How can I do this? It should be more about how can I put out something that's gonna help these players and have them be like, wow, you know, this new Instagram page I found or this new YouTube channel, I'm subscribing, I'm following, I want to see more of their content because this is really helpful to me. And it doesn't just have to be helpful. You can have content that's like more like F2 freestylers where it's more about the um, entertainment value. That's still providing value to people, but you just need to find out what your niche is. And that would actually be my second tip is find what your niche or niche is. Um, for example, like my niche is, is to really go after those players that are really, really serious about training, that want to play at the professional level, that want to play at the collegiate level, and to create content tailored to helping those people specifically. I mean, I, you know, you, there's tons of players out there, and I could make content about how to juggle a soccer ball or, you know, five funny nutmegs, and, and that could be a great video that would do really, really well. But my niche, the, 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 my target audience, 
I don't think that would benefit them the most. I don't think that's what they're looking for. I want to create more of a workout video. I want to create a, a better training session, give tips on how to create a, a highlight video on CV, give tips on, or give advice on how to contact pro coaches or talk about my journey. I think that's going to benefit that niche that I'm going after of very serious, dedicated, talented players that are just looking to reach the next level or the professional level. That's what my niche is. So you need to find what your niche is, whatever your brand is. And then the third and the final tip that I would give is that you need to be completely obsessed about building your brand and you need to do the macro view, uh, that same micro macro view that I talked about earlier in this this podcast about my career, I also had that for building my brand. You need to do, and you need to be obsessed in the short term and constantly working, constantly creating content, constantly filming podcasts or YouTube videos or creating Instagram posts or Instagram stories or TikToks or whatever your platform is and where it is and whatever you want to create. You need to be constantly working to create content, fresh new content for those platforms constantly looking to collab with other creators, constantly looking to build your brand in other ways and to, to market it, to build it, to grow it with Facebook ads or whatever. You need to be obsessed in the short term of constantly, constantly grinding to build it. But also you need to look at the, the long-term macro view of that you're not trying to get a million followers in a day. 10 followers a day is going to add up. And soon it will be 20 new followers a day and then a hundred new followers a day and then a thousand new followers a day. But you need to look at it at the grand scheme of things. It took me nine months to build up to my first a thousand subscribers on YouTube, nine months of putting out videos constantly and constant work. And then I just have this view of it's okay. Like I'm not, I'm not in it to try to get a million subscribers or a million followers in a year. I'm all about what is this going to look like 10 years down the road? And so 20 years down the road, you know, have that macro patience of, yeah, it, it will come. If I do the short term grind every single day, I have the patience to wait 20 years in order to reach a million subscribers on YouTube or to build my brand. So that's, those would be like my three tips really about building, um, building a brand, building a company, building whatever you want to build on social media. Um, lastly, last, very last one. Um, what is your favorite moment of your career so far? That's a, another good question. I, I think I have, I think I have two, to be honest, maybe three, I'd say, obviously I think the, the first pro contracts, <clears throat> sorry, the first pro contracts always huge. I think that when you sign your first pro contract, it's always, I think one of the most exciting days, um, I've talked about it though, about how you have that weird mix of emotions of like, I finally did it. And at the same time, I've, this is just the beginning. I've just finally now broken in and this is where it really begins. So you have this weird thing of like, I made it, I did it combined with, I've done nothing. This is just, I'm just starting. So it's this weird mix of like, yay. And also like, I need to get to work. Um, so that's, that's a cool moment. And I think a very big milestone, but the fit, my favorite parts of my career, I think had more to do with coming back, honestly, from, from injuries, I'd say for one, uh, after dropping down to New Zealand and then coming back and then signing that, that contract with the Tulsa Roughnecks for the 2019 season. I think that was one of my favorite moments of my career just because, and this was like my third or fourth or fifth maybe even fifth pro contract, I don't even know. But it was one of my favorite moments because I proved to myself and proved to many people who had doubted me in person or online or whatever that my career was over, that I was finished, I was making a, a big mistake, that I could return back to the pro level after suffering uh, multiple surgeries, after going through, after dropping down the, the semi-professional level, I could return to the pro level. And it, it really did prove to me that you know, that an injury wasn't going to end my career, that an injury wasn't going to stop me or end my pro career or whatever. And it, I really had a lot of, of doubt myself if I could do it, if I could return even physically back up to the level that I once was. So doing that just meant a lot to me personally. And it's funny is because like when I signed my first pro contract, you know, my parents were obviously extremely excited. But when I signed that contract with the Tulsa Roughnecks in 2019 and, and returned and made that return back, to the professional level after going through all of those obstacles from 2017 through 2018, 
um, that was when my mom like cried up, up upon hearing that I signed that contract. So it's funny that she was more emotional about that contract, my fourth or fifth contract than my very first one. But I felt the same exact way that that contract meant a lot more to me than that very first one. It, it's just almost, it's like, um, the harder it is to get something, the harder you work to achieve something, the, the better it feels. So I feel like that kind of like rang true with that contract because I've been through so much and I finally accomplished what I've been really, you know, struggling with for the last two years with injuries and, and doubters and, and all that stuff. So I think that was a huge moment for me and one of my favorite moments in my career. And then also, you know, <laughs> after I was so excited and, you know, to join the Roughnecks for that 2019 season. Um, but then after that, you know, from the, in the very first game, I then go and get another sports hernia on my opposite side and struggled again through another surgery, another full rehab program coming back. And that very first game um, back now. So now it's been even, it's been a crazy two, three years now through surgeries and injuries and, and, and a lot of hardship getting to play in that very first game, coming back from that surgery now and playing against the Sacramento Republic in front of 10,000 people and, and really just soaking it all in. And I remember being there in the starting lineup and hearing the national anthem and, and looking around and seeing 10,000, 12,000 fans in, in the stands and, and hearing the drums and the, the, you know, the ultras behind the, the goal and all that stuff that really was a very special moment because it was like, enjoy this because you can see just how easily it is to have everything taken away from you from one wrong injury, one wrong move. So I, I really, really focused on enjoying that moment, enjoying that game and soaking it all in because I had seen how easy everything can be taken away from me. So that was another big moment. So first contract, contract, the first con my very first contract ever, my very first contract with the Roughnecks after coming back from New Zealand, and then my very first game back from my third surgery now for the sports hernia. I think those three moments really stick out to me in my career. Um, so anyway, that's all the questions that I'm going to answer in this podcast. It's, what are we looking at? About a, a little bit over an hour, maybe. I have to edit it up and see. But uh, yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did, please, please hit the thumbs up button, subscribe. And I'll see you guys in the next video. And once again, thank you to Santa Barbara Chocolate for sponsoring uh, this episode of the podcast. And if you guys want to check out their vegan cocoa powder or any of their products, you can click the link in my description or head to santabarbarachocolate.com and uh, give them a look. All right, guys. Peace. Peace.